often, you know, when you talk to the wives of um, Vietnam vets or other family members, you know, they'll say just sort of a, a, a constant feeling of dread that they lived with. And often they'll use the same language of, you know, of the government sedan rolling up in front of the house. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, go, not going to bring good news. Um, you, and so going into this, I, it, this is the first notice then that a lot of these families, perhaps almost all of them are going to have that something has happened. It better be the first notice. That's the, that was the whole intent. That they would be the first notice. They wouldn't learn of it some other way. They wouldn't see it on the news. They wouldn't hear it from a, a friend or, a, 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 you know, someplace, some other way. It was, it was all designed to this, that the in-person notification would be the first thing they heard. You had been a Marine in uh, South Vietnam, the northern part of South Vietnam, I Corps. Marines were lost uh, in conflict in combat situations under your command. You yourself were wounded. Um, so you had personal experience of, of what combat loss looked like on the ground in, in South Vietnam. That you had that long deployment. You had another after that. You had another lengthy deployment in the Mediterranean, and now you're looking at another deployment, which will bring keep you away from your wife again. And so you ask for a different kind of job, so that you can actually have a life with your wife, whom you haven't seen very much in the past two years. When word comes that this job is going to be casualty notification. And I'm thinking, especially in light of the fact that you know what that looks like on the front end in South Vietnam, did you have any reluctance? Did you have any second thoughts as well? I, you know, I, I didn't want to deploy overseas again, but I'm not sure I wanted to do this job. What was your response to getting the news that this would be your work with the Marine Corps? I didn't have one. I had I got my objective. I went. It was going to be somewhere where I could live with my wife, and uh, I would do whatever they wanted me to do. I I figured I just figured I could do the job. And after I got there and got started at it, uh, I think I did it well. Uh, I think I was well suited to it. Mm. Uh, the uh, uh, I, at, at the time, I, uh, I was wearing a, uh, I had a bronze star, purple heart, and a combat action ribbon, some other stuff, but I had enough credentials that I was, uh, that helped or credibility for me to talk to the, talk to the families about what had happened. Um, uh, that, at least that helped. But I, I, I just had, uh, uh, I, I just figured I could help them through whatever, you know, whatever. I, I just helped them get them through what had happened. Uh, so. Walk us through the process. And um, do you have a rough sense of how many notifications you made? Uh, I, I don't remember. Um, how many total I made of the, of the including WIAs and others. Um, I, I didn't have as many calls as a lot of folks had in, in, uh, in larger, more dense, densely populated areas. Um, I had about 24 deaths to, to identify. But uh, the, it, they sent me to Salt Lake City uh, to do that duty primarily, not because of the number of calls, but because of the distances involved. Uh, I averaged, uh, this is averaged, uh, over 100 miles a call. Wow. Now, in, in Utah, 80% at the time, 80% of the people in Utah lived uh, 40 miles north or south of Salt Lake City from Ogden, Salt Lake City, and Provo. So that's where 80% of the people did. It seems like, uh, you know, but once once I left there, I covered 
uh, Nevada as far west as Carlin and as far south as Ely, and then also covered the, the south uh, eastern portion of Idaho uh, up to um, so you, you know, Idaho, Fall, uh, Idaho Falls and Twin uh, on the northern edge, and then uh, well past that actually, and then Twin Falls on the on the south uh, west side. I got up to Boise one time when the people at Normal Hand Boise, or Boise were overwhelmed with their casualties in their in, in their immediate area. So I went up and handled one up there. I think you said 24 death notifications in in your time in this work. Yes. And that, that includes, I'm sorry, I didn't cut you off, but that includes not only the KIs, but also those who uh, non some non-combatant deaths. So accidents and things like that. Yeah, uh, we had one man uh, who uh, fell out of a watchtower in uh, in in Vietnam. Uh, another man who uh, was killed in a vehicle a government vehicle accident in uh, uh, naval ammunition depot. Uh, Humble uh, somewhere uh, somewhere in Nevada um, had. Uh, uh, a lieutenant who was killed uh, with an act by an accidental discharge of an M16 by somebody else, and that was in that was in Vietnam. Uh, a young Marine who was killed with an accidental discharge of 45 while he was assuming post in um, in um, in uh, Vietnam and near MAF headquarters. Um, had another Marine who was uh, um, it was at Saigon at the Marine barracks. Saigon came back, uh, threw up and suffocated on his own system in, um, uh, in Saigon. So um, there were other, other if, you, if you were in the, you know, there were other reasons to make the not in-person notification. And in these cases, um, was the goal to, to be as, to use the word that's used a lot these days, to be as transparent as possible, or was there a desire at the time? Um, for I'm assuming, just as an example, I'm assuming that this Marine who vomited and then um, uh, choked on that. I'm assuming alcohol or drugs or something were involved. I, I don't know if, if that's a safe assumption or not, but that, that's an assumption I have. But um, was the goal at the time to be as transparent as possible or in these cases where, you know, that might have been something questionable, um, somebody had acted in an irresponsible way, maybe? Was there a desire to kind of soften that a bit how would that go you told them you told them what you knew uh, when the initial notification comes in you don't always know the whole story but you tell them what you know and you tell them straight um, on on the cases uh, on that that particular case uh, you tell them what happened there uh, in in those cases of uh, uh, you know I had another lieutenant killed by an aircraft accident and that's all I ever knew uh, the you you tell them what you know in the cases of uh, non-combatant, no, not a clear case of, of, of a minor explosion or a gunshot wound or whatever. Um, there's an investigation. In, in most of the in the cases, of those accidental discharges, there was an investigation. Uh, uh, in cases uh, for the marine from the the uh, marine barracks in Saigon, there was an investigation. Um, uh, so you, when the investigation is done, you go you go back to the family and, and you report that investigation to them as well. Um, but you don't hide anything. You don't guess at it. Uh, you, you certainly don't guess at it. You you tell them what you know, and uh, you tell it to them straight. I wonder if you could just walk us through, sort of step by step, and and I you know, you've got different things to relate, different accounts to relate. You're dealing with different people, 
different personality. So I imagine in details, it's going to work out differently. Um, I imagine in some cases, folks are, you know, want you inside. Maybe in other cases, they just keep you on the, the porch. I don't know how all these things go. But if you could just walk us through sort of step by step, beginning with the car you're in pulls up in front of the residence, and then how, how does it unfold from there? Uh, once you find the address, uh, you, you, you go, let's say you go to that address, say it's a, it's a residence, you go to the house and you, you, you ask to be sure who you're looking for. Let me just next, pause you real quick. Are you by yourself? I'm by myself. Wow. The recommended way to do it was with at least two of you. Uh, they had other recommendations at the time, you know, that you get the local priest or chaplain or somebody to go with you. That's that something that, that never worked. Um, I uh, taking other Marines from the I and I staff to go with me uh, didn't work well. Uh, it, it worked well for me to handle it by myself on the initial notifications. Um, so uh, you identify who you're looking for. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. Um, and uh, if they're not, then you can find out, well, where are they? And you tell them, do not contact them until I get there, you know, before I get there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then once you've identified them, you identify yourself, you tell them why you're there and you tell them what you know about the situation um, and then answer questions you can after that. So- Were there instances where somebody said, well, the person you're looking for isn't here, but the person is at the store, the person is some other place. And would you go to those other places and try to yeah. find the person there? Let me let me give you an example. I, I gave you a name there earlier too of, of a, a, a certain, um, um, Taller? Tutor, yeah. Tutor. Yeah. The, uh, um, his next weekend was, was, was his wife. Uh, we had an address. Uh, uh, went to that address. She was, she, the address was actually his home. His, my, his parents lived there. Uh, his, uh, his mother was home. Uh, his wife was not, she was at work. Uh, so they gave me the address of where she was and I went to that address, found her at work, uh, mm. uh, walked in and asked for her at that, at that uh, business. And uh, she said, I, I don't know if I want to talk to you. I said, well, we need to talk anyway. And um, uh, Told her that uh, her husband uh, had been uh, wounded, uh, that he was, uh, 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 his condition wasn't good, and that his prognosis was guarded. And that was on the 11th of December. Um, several days later, I uh, went back and found her at work again and had to tell her. I had to tell her that they'd had to amputate her leg because of the wounds. His, then his prognosis was still guarded. Uh, when he died on the 23rd of December, I uh, went back and uh, made the death notification. Uh, Uh, and that was one of the one of the hardest ones that I had to make. Um, um, and then afterwards, there was a lot of, of follow up contact. But uh, um, that's off, you know that's often how it went. You know, that's the general run of things. That that included all that example includes uh, the, the, uh, what you do with a, a wounded marine, and then what you do wind up if he dies of wounds. So that's, those are the hard, I think those for me were the hardest to do, most difficult. 
All three times in this case, you find Mrs. Tuller at her workplace. The last time I think of, I was at, actually at home. At home. Yeah. Um, what was, I'm interested in what happened in the workplace. Were there, did she have fellow employees who understood that something serious was going on and did they sort of evacuate or did you we go went, to a quiet room or we something? Went to, we went to a quieter room, went back to a, into a, a more um, closed off area. Mm -hmm. office. One of the most poignant things, and I mean, I'm actually even feeling it now. One of the most poignant things I've ever heard is from a wife of a Marine helicopter pilot. And she and her um, husband, who actually was heading to Vietnam soon, they had just come home from grocery shopping. And they saw one of these government sedans in the parking lot. And one of the memories that lives on in my in my mind was when we were in the final aspects of his flight training living in california um in santa ana where he was doing the the last stages of his helicopter training yeah um we were living in an apartment complex and one day we came home from shopping mm. And there was a black government car at the curb. Mm. And neither one of us thought anything about it, but we put our things down on the kitchen table and we heard this heart-wrenching scream from the apartment beside us. Oh, wow. And nobody had to tell us oh, no. what it meant. And, and I can remember at that moment thinking, I am not staying here in California. Um, while Ron is gone, I'm going home because if that black car ever pulls up to my curb, I want to be with people that love me. Just the impact on her of hearing what another wife was dealing with as one of your counterparts was speaking with her. Um, in all of the interactions you had um, with folks, is there one or two interactions that really stands out in your mind? Um, Tuller, of course. Um, I mean, I made a, uh, a, a call on uh, parents of a wounded Marine. Uh, and while I was relaying information to the uh, to the mother, their German, young German shepherd was chewing on the back of my leg. Uh, and uh, um, I couldn't, I didn't, you know, want to kick at her or whatever. To, well, this uh, is just one of these sort of the absurdities of. Yeah, that and uh, I, I made a call in um, Nevada on a young wife whose husband had been killed. Um, she was in a community where uh, when, when the vehicle pulls up and they see a Marine in uniform or a service member in uniform, um, it, uh, people take notice. Uh, when I found her, uh, extended family and neighbors came over immediately or they were there before they actually finished talking to her. Um, I, uh, stayed there uh, a, a little bit because she was she was very shaken. Um, she, uh, I was standing in one room and, and she at this at this particular point and she was in a in an adjoining room. I stayed in where I stood where I could see her uh, all the time, uh, and people were asking me questions about about things, uh, neighbors and, and uh, family. Uh, at one time, I, I turned just briefly to, to look at somebody that asked me a question, and I turned back, and she was gone. So I immediately went into the other room and said, where'd she go? They said, well, they, she just went out back. So I went out back of the house, and I said, there were some people out there. I said, where is she? And they said, she took off running that way, uh, down toward the bridge. She had run down to a bridge uh, and jumped off. Uh, 
luckily uh, the bridge wasn't as high as a lot of them uh, and the water was very low uh, I ran down went, went down uh, to the and, and got her a crowd had, had already gathered at the bridge uh, when I arrived and no one was had gone down to help her no one was up there uh, about the time I got to her down below uh, their voice from up on the on the bank said I'm a Navy corpsman. Can I help? I said, yeah, give me a blanket. And so somewhere within seconds, he had a blanket and brought it down to me. And we I picked her up and took her back up to the house. Um, it, she was just so distraught that she she didn't know, you know, even with all the su support around her, um, she was uh, she didn't know how to handle it at that time. I came back and made uh, a follow-up call and um, she was much better at that time but still partly embarrassed by, by what had happened she needn't have been I don't in, in my estimation but it's just you know, things like that that stick out to you wow. there's um, uh, let me tell you about another one um, I had a, um, a call came in and um, uh, the sergeant in the other room, I was at my desk and he said to me that this was a, a cash notification call coming in. So he was taking the information down. I picked up an extension so I could listen in and um, they were reading off everything and, and the, you know, his name, what had happened uh, next to Ken. Um, and they, they gave the address of, as, as a, just Cottonwood, Utah. And at that time, I had been doing this a little while, and I knew Utah fairly well. And I said, Cotton, I thought, like, Cottonwood, Cottonwood. So I reached my desk and pulled out a map and started looking for Cottonwood. And uh, about that time, the, the casually uh, uh, person from headquarters, Marine Corps, says, um, mailing address, and gives an address in Durango, Colorado. And I'm thinking, oh no. Uh, so uh, that was an indication to me that this was probably uh, a shepherd, a sheep herder, uh, lived on a, a ranch somewhere. Uh, and this might be difficult to find. And then he said, then he got down to special instructions. And he said, I mean, this, the special instructions were go to the cafe in Cisco, Utah and get directions. So I knew Cisco, and it, Cisco was just a very, very, very small town, it hardly exists now. Um, so I thought, and then he started to give the date. I came on the line, identified myself and said, uh, um, this is Captain Croy, uh, because of this location, I'm gonna need some extra time uh, because I know, I know about where this is. Uh, we need some extra time. When you look on the map at that time, this was in the, the southeast portion of Utah that was just blank. It was just, it was just there, were, there were no roads that showed up on the map. Now, there were lots of roads there, but they didn't show up on the map. So uh, they gave me some extra time. I, I called my wife and said, uh, make me a lunch and a thermos. I got to go. I'm going to come home and, and uh, change and, and um uh, and they get a fresh uniform. Um, I changed in civilian clothes for the drive down there because it was hot. Um, and then in Green River, stopped at a gas station, got into uniform, uh, drove on over to Cisco, uh, walked into the cafe, and there were about a dozen people in there. And as soon as I walked in, everything just went quiet. Everybody stopped talking. Uh, I went to the uh, lady that was at the cashier at the at the cash register and said, I'm looking for Cottonwood, Utah. And she said, you mean Cottonwood Ranch? I said, well, maybe. Uh, she said, well, you go back out here to the highway, um, go east uh, three tenths of a mile, and there's a road that turns off to the left, goes up over the railroad tracks. But she, she's down to the end of that road, you can't miss it. So I go back into the highway, go down three to three tenths of a mile exactly. And there's a road that goes up over the railroad tracks. 
I said, well, good. And this is this is working out, maybe. Um, so like after you start down that road uh, a good distance, the road forks, evenly traveled. No indication of any play of, of one which way is the right way to go. It, they just look equally, you know, equally traveled road. There is a, a card handwritten cord, cardboard sign on the one that goes off to the right that says Agate Field. And I said, well, I thought I don't I want to go to the to the left first. Now, in this particular case, because I, I knew where I, in general it was, I took my own vehicle. I had a Jeep at the time. Um, and it's authorized to do that. Uh, and they you know, reimbursed me for mileage. But uh, we didn't have a vehicle assigned to the, to the unit that would handle uh, rough terrain. So I go off to the right. I go uh, as far as it goes. And it ends at a sheet pen and a draw up the, uh, the lower part of the mesa. Uh, and it's beginning to get dark. No cell phones, no GPS. Um, so, and it, you, I keep track of my gas, how many miles I used to back to, to, to get gas, uh, and how many, how long it would take to get back to a landline, a phone to make call headquarters, Marine Corps, and say, hold the telegram. So, uh, turn around, start back up. I'm going, to, I'm going to go back up to that V and take take another road. Well, out of the corner of my eye, I see a, a light back up another draw, up another canyon. Uh, so I, I start looking at it and I start going across country uh, and going across washes and finally find a track that leads in that general direction. You get on it and go back and, and sure enough, there's a, there's a Coleman lantern hanging on a pole outside the house. Uh, so, uh, drive up there and there's a, a coal and lantern and then a house and there's as I drive up there's somebody a man comes out of the house there's a dozen or more sheep dogs roaming around in the area too um, so uh, I get out and I, you know, I said, I'm, I'm looking for a, a, I call him by name the person I was looking for and I, he said well that's me I said well can we go in and talk for a minute so we go in and I identify myself and I tell him why I'm there. Uh, and tell him that his, uh, uh, that his son um, is uh, in the hospital in, in uh, uh, Saigon. He, uh, he's in good condition and uh, uh, he's had a surgical extraction of a tooth. Um, at that point, the uh, man pauses a minute, looks at me and says, I didn't even know he was in the Marine Corps. This was his son. And, and my mouth must have dropped open or something because right after that, he looked at me and said, uh, in, with a concern on his face, he said, uh, do you want to sit down? So we sat out at the, at the kitchen table there and it, it turns out, he, he said, uh, his son had been in the Marine Corps. He had gotten out and was living with his sister down in Las Vegas. Um, Re-enlistment opportunities came up with a bargain that he could keep his rank and get his duty station he wanted. So he went back in Didn't he, and his dad said, he doesn't write much. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, the, we had a nice discussion and then I left and, and started back where I went down to Moab and spent the night. Yeah. Uh, so but, well, I mean, what you've described here, just these, the extremes of the responses that you'll see. Yeah. And the first one where the woman, you know, jumps off the bridge is actually easier for me to understand than, than the one you, you just, just described there. Did you ever have instances where you come to the door, people know why you're there and they really, they don't invite you in, they really they just they'll take whatever basic message you have and and that's it and then they'll just close the door no i didn't didn't have anything like that i, I had most everybody that that i encountered were were very patriotic very and mostly family oriented as well uh, it was uh, and 
um, they were um, appreciative, or at least they indicated, I said so, as said as much, appreciative of, of uh, the giving this, even this bad information uh, or unpleasant information. Sure. Uh, but didn't have didn't have any uh, apathy or uh, hostility. One follow up call. I had not made the original call on this on this family, but I, I, an award came in uh, for the marine who had been killed. Uh, so I made arrangements to go up and, and present the award to the family. Um, uh, they were very um, I started to say hostile, but that may not be the exact word. They were very um, bitter. bitter. I didn't know very much about the case to begin with. Uh, only what was you know what we'd recorded on the on the card um, about the notification. Uh, apparently, they had picked up something that he had written home about. Um, but they were just you know, they were just really bitter about that and voiced that uh, very strongly. Um, I was still didn't try to correct their uh, or inform their view any other way. Uh, uh, stayed an appropriate amount of time and and uh, excused myself. Um, but that's the worst of it. I have I've talked to other people that are on this kind of duty who had, had um, open, you know, or experienced open, open hostility, but um, I just, I didn't. And is your, is your <clears throat> responsibility in this position not to try to reason, not to try and certainly not to try to debate, just to be respectful, to listen, to stay for a respectable period of time and then and then in these in in the in the case like the one you just described, just you know, extract yourself from the from the situation. Yeah, uh, yeah. You you go do what you're supposed to do, and and uh, and, and you know, don't certainly don't aggravate the situation. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of there are a number of times on, on follow up um, follow up calls like that where. Um, uh, the family was just very, very pleasant and welcoming. Uh, uh, one uh, a lieutenant's uh, family in Idaho, uh, who was just very, very uh, pleasant, opening, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, we we they made the arrangements for, for me to come up and present the award. Uh, and made it around supper time. We all had supper together, and, and it was just a very uh, you know, welcoming time. Most of these cases were were you know people very very welcoming. Um, there was one case on a follow up call where I actually took my wife, and uh, uh, there was a young wife. Um, I think this was down in Price or Helper, Utah. I think it's Price, Utah, um, where I took her with me on a follow-up call because of of uh, I, the, the uh, there because of rapport she would have with this young wife and and the young wife's living with her with her mother. Um, so uh, that worked out exceptionally well that, in that particular case. That's just that's not something that that I did on a routine basis at all. But and also that was before we had before we had our son. Uh, but it, that worked out very very well. Uh, and uh, so it just. You just try to help. You don't know how what reaction you're going to get. You don't know how well the, the next of kin is going to take the um, the message that you're going to deliver. Uh, and 
there I look for ways just to help out help people out and uh anyway any way that was right were you given much training or were you just sort of handed this <laughs> handed this I duty know, I, I was told where to show up and that was it uh the, the training was done on the job uh the first the first uh, call that i made was a uh a man who had been wounded, um, and I went with uh, uh, one of the senior staff and COs on the uh, I and I staff, and um, uh, that's when I decided that I could probably do a better job by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so oh. we there was a there was a, there were written documents about how to handle it. Uh, some of them, you know, some of them was was ill-conceived ideas um mm -hmm. and uh so it was just seemed like better to be a, a, a try to be a real person and uh, help them get through uh, a tough time or start through a tough time show them a, a path that they could help get through this time wow so you didn't go through any four or five week school <laughs> no the art of empathy or no 